Happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lord and Arts channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today on Halloween Day. I hope you guys are safe, have a lot of fun, but stay safe when you're out there tonight or if you're taking your kids out there tonight. Of course, this is Case Cracked, the show where we look into a mystery and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery. Today's episode is called The Witch Killers. In March of 1981, a San Francisco landlord decided it was time to do a little remodeling on some apartments he owned. After reaching out to a plumber, the two made their way down to the basement apartment located in the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood. The apartment was being rented by 23-year-old Karen Barnes, an aspiring actress from Georgia who had a big, bright personality and showed a lot of promise in her trade. She shared the space with two roommates, a married couple named Michael and Susan Bear. When the landlord and plumber entered, they were stopped in their tracks. They found Karen lying face down, dead in a pool of blood. She had been stabbed multiple times in the head, 13 times to be exact, and her body was wrapped in a blanket. The room itself was covered in painted, mysterious, esoteric symbols, along with one word, Susan. Investigators at first feared the young couple that had been staying with her had met the same fate, but they were nowhere to be found. All their possessions were also gone. When Karen's friends were questioned, they said that the couple, who they described as two hippie Muslim drug dealers, had been living with her, and their names were indeed Michael and Susan Bear. However, when her family was questioned, they said that the couple's names were actually James and Sue Carson. All of the names were checked, but nothing could be found, not an ID or even a marriage certificate. A year later, a surfer and marijuana farm worker named Clark Stevens was found dead in Humboldt County, California. He had been shot twice, and had been reported missing just two weeks earlier. His body had been burned and then hidden underneath chicken manure. Luckily, the murderer buried Clark's ID close by as well, making his identification happen very quickly. Clark's death went on to inspire others to refer to the area as Murder Mountain. Today, there have been many more people reported missing in the region and more have been found dead, adding to this area's infamy. Near Clark's body, investigators found what appeared to be an abandoned backpack that contained a manifesto called Cry for War. In it, the writer called for the death of all witches, as well as former President Ronald Reagan and The Tonight Show host Johnny Carson. Fingerprints taken from the items in the bag came back to James and Sue Carson. Knowing it was no coincidence that the pair had popped up near this murder as well, the couple was again sought for questioning. When Clark's co-workers on the farm were questioned, they mentioned that a couple who went by the names Michael and Susan Bear had been working with Clark. Clark felt that the pair didn't work hard enough, causing tension between the three. Unfortunately, investigators still could not locate the couple. In January of 1983, a gruesome murder was witnessed by several drivers and passers-by on the roadside of the 101 freeway near Napa Valley, California. As they watched, a pickup truck on the road pulled over to the shoulder. There were two passengers, one female and one male, along with the driver, a man named John Hellyer. A scuffle broke out in the cab of the truck before all three quickly exited the vehicle. From under the driver's seat, the male passenger produced a gun and began to wrestle with John, trying to shoot him. As they struggled, the woman produced a knife and began to stab him. Finally, the male passenger was able to gain control of the gun, and John was shot and killed. They left the 30-year-old there to die on the side of the road, while his killers stole his truck and quickly left the scene. A fruit stand worker nearby called in the murder, and police soon found themselves in a high-speed chase. It didn't last long, as the truck ended up driving into a ditch. When the officers arrested the couple, they realized they had finally found the elusive Michael and Susan Bear Carson, also known as James and Sue Carson. 32-year-old Michael Bear was born James Clifford Carson. 
He was originally a stay-at-home father who sold marijuana out of the Phoenix apartment he shared with his first wife and their daughter, Jennifer. James, who was also a Chinese philosophy major, reportedly adored his family. That was until he met Sue Thornis Hamilton. James met Sue at a Thanksgiving party. She was the daughter of an Arizona newspaper executive and had a history of mental illness. She was also recently divorced, and James fell in love with her quickly. She renamed him Michael after the Archangel, and the two began to go by the last name of Bear. With the couple in custody, investigators were ready to press charges for all of the cases. The couple refused to answer questions, but offered a trade. They agreed to confess to all of their deeds if they would be allowed to do it at a televised press conference, and they were allowed to do exactly that. For the next five to six hours, the couple told of their exploits with joy, often smiling and showing affection towards each other at every grisly turn. They claimed to be vegetarian Muslim warriors in a holy war against witches, Michael claimed that Susan was a yogi and a mystic with knowledge of the past, present, and future. Their killing spree started after the two spent time traveling Europe and started dropping acid as well as LSD daily. After they were wed at Stonehenge during a full moon, Susan was given a message. The couple were to kill all witches that they came across. They stated that Karen Barnes had to be killed. While the couple stayed with her, she had agreed to convert to Islam. However, they soon learned that she was not only faking her conversion, but according to them, she was also a psychic vampire witch that was draining and blocking all of Susan's powers. Clark Stevens was a petty witch and a demon who they found was again using Susan's essence to feed himself. They also claimed that he sexually assaulted Susan, but no proof of that was ever found. Investigators found that Clark likely upset the couple with his heavy drinking and loud voice. John Hellyer was also a witch who was demonic in the couple's eyes. They stated that he had also sexually assaulted Susan. Again, there is no proof of this. And that he called her a witch. So, like all the others, he had to go. Everyone at the press conference was left in shock that day. It was determined that although Susan was suffering from her own mental illnesses, the couple had fallen victim to a shared psychosis or shared delusional disorder. In French, this syndrome is called folie à deux or madness of two. Wikipedia tells us that this is a rare delusional disorder shared by two or occasionally more people with close emotional ties. This disorder is a collection of rare psychiatric syndromes in which symptoms of a delusional belief, and sometimes even hallucinations, are transmitted from one individual to another. The bears fed off of each other's delusions and fantasies as they traveled, did hallucinogens, and squandered Susan's trust fund. There were several times that the couple could have been caught. After all, Susan's name was written on the wall at the murder scene of Karen Barnes, Michael was picked up by police in November of 1982 after Clark's murder when an old acquaintance saw him hitchhiking. A police error allowed him to walk away without even being questioned. If they had been caught, John wouldn't have met his tragic fate. In May of 1984, the couple pled not guilty in court, even though they had admitted to the three murders. They recanted their statements, but there was an abundance of physical evidence that tied them to the murders. In short order, they were found guilty of all three murders. After the verdict was announced, Susan screamed to the court, What is my crime? To be beautiful? To be an artist? For Karen's murder, they received 25 years in prison. For Clark, they received 50 years to life. And for John, they received 75 years to life. To this day, the couple will answer no questions involving other murders that they're suspected of committing, not only here in the U.S., but abroad as well. Quote, When my mom met my father, he was a nice Jewish boy, said Michael's daughter, Jennifer. No one could have foreseen this, especially how weird it got. Being the daughter of a serial killer offered many unique challenges for Jennifer as she grew older. Now, 
She advocates for children of prisoners in the hope that she can help to spare them some of the pain that she went through. The last time that Jennifer saw her father, she visited him in prison at the age of 19. She said, quote, It was like looking into the eyes of someone with no soul. He is pure evil. To this day, the couple shows no remorse for their crimes. Case Cracked I would like to thank The Daily Beast, Newspapers.com, Ranker.com, The New York Post, The Journal, San FranciscoGate.com, UPI.com, Mercury News, and Wikipedia. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case, and here she is now to discuss it with us. Christy, I just want to start by asking, are you trying to give us all nightmares? This one really could give you nightmares. Yeah. I mean, I just, I want everybody to know how much there was to unpack with this. It's unreal. It really is. And the more you go down the rabbit hole, the stranger and the stranger everything gets. If you're wanting to get a good overview of everything, check out A Cry for War, the story of Susan and Michael Carson by Rick Reynolds. It's, it's pretty good. And okay. it'll, it'll give you a lot of information that we certainly couldn't put in here. Okay. Gotcha. Is that a, that's a book? That's a full book? Or is that yes. a documentary? Okay. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. I can't believe that they actually gave them that press conference. Like, I mean, just here, I mean, it, it's weird because, you know, for a confession, like they'll obviously take some things into consideration, but letting them just sit there and like relive all of these terrible things that they did, like this, I mean, this story already has like natural born killers vibe all over it. Oh, but yeah. that just took things to a whole different level. Like that's that's really out there. I've never heard of anything like that. I haven't either. And what this is something that bothered me too. Now, this couple has been separated for decades now. Yeah. But they still both refuse to give up their beliefs. Now, when two people are separated like this, does foil a do does it wear off? Do they do they start to, you know, now that they're not influencing each other, do they start to look at what they did and see the crazy in it? I, I mean, it doesn't look like in this case that's happened. No, no, it doesn't. I mean, I think that this case is just a great example of how beliefs can be powerful tools. Um, and, you know, they could be just as powerful for good as well. But yes. um, they've, they've obviously just talked themselves into this position of, justifying all these bizarre actions by labeling these other people they were witches this was a religious belief of ours like we you know we were spoken to by god when we got married at stonehenge like they have romanticized that belief to the point that maybe they can't let it go and honestly why would they let it go now when they have nothing else in their life like all they have i mean i'm sure they have some type of life in prison but it's obviously not a very fulfilling existence yeah uh why are they at this point going to let go of those memories they loved the memory so much they wanted to sit down and tell everyone about it so they could relive it again and that that's probably what they're doing in prison just sitting in there tr treading through it over and over writing it down trying to get every ounce of memory they can out of it um I just hope there's no chance that they're ever going to get out. Like it, I think that would be part of the belief, right? Oh, I'm going to keep this going. And eventually like, you know, maybe Susan is hitting some kind of new spiritual level and pretty soon she's going to just come melting through the door and then we can be together again or something like, I just, I hope there's no chance of them ever getting released. Well, in 2015, they were offered a chance at parole. Back then, the prisons were overcrowded, so anybody who had served 25 years or more was eligible to get out. They just had to go through their parole hearing. Now, Michael canceled his. He said that there was no way they were going to let him out of jail until he renounced his beliefs, and he wasn't going to do that. <laughs> wow. Wow. Now, Susan allowed her attorney to go into the hearing and represent her, but she didn't really act one way or the other if she cared, to be honest. I think she's in her own little world there. Yeah. Now, Jennifer Carson, which is Michael's daughter. Now, she, as we saw, is an advocate for children of prisoners, which is fantastic. And she started a change.org petition to keep Susan in jail. Now, she said, quote, she'll pass away in prison. She'll spend the rest of her life in prison. And that's what should happen. It's not vindictive, but it's for safety and accountability to the public. And she added 
as long as Susan can lift a hand, she could harm somebody. And I think she's right. Yeah. And especially if they're still holding on to those belief structures, then. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, luckily, they were both denied parole. Okay. But it will come up again. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, hopefully we're just going to see a repeat of the same situation. They're going to hold their position so. and yeah, they, they won't get anywhere. Uh, Christy, thank you so much for all of your work on today's episode. We really appreciate you and happy Halloween. Oh, you too. And I've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you, PayPal supporters Brandy Fry, and a special thank you to Dana and Mick Calcutt, the parents of Colin Madsen, for their recent donation to the channel. You guys really didn't have to do that, but we certainly do appreciate it. For over six years, we have always run limited commercial ads here on YouTube, and we can't do that without support. If you'd like to help the channel keep going and growing, please visit lordandarts.com. There, you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee, like Candy Bishop recently did. We know that learning about the mechanisms that help support and find justice in these cases is important to understand the many unsolved cases we also cover, and we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing that. Remember, you can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit seriouslymysterious.com and subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. While you're here, please don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon below. We'll see you again on Friday with a brand new unsolved mystery here on the Lord and Arts channel.